as many of you will know, some graduate recruitment processes are long, some are short, but they all involve uh, some element of selection by their very nature, uh, and it's a real art and a science, and, and so we're uh, really pleased today to be joined by uh, Brian, Becky and Rhea from three different uh, really uh, good organisations who, who do a lot of graduate recruitment work, um, and uh, they're going to give us their perspectives on selection um, and both the sort of methods involved and perhaps also uh, casting ahead about what, what we might see in terms of evolving trends in selection. Um, they're going to do sort of five to ten minutes each in terms of uh, giving us a, a sense of their approach to uh, the topic and then uh, should leave us with sort of 20-25 minutes for uh, a panel discussion and Q&A so please start getting your questions lined up and ready and we'll, we'll hopefully get some from uh, the Twitter sphere as well and this one is actually going out on live on Periscope as well so we'll pick, pick up one or two people on there as well all being well. So um, first up I'm going to hand over to uh, Brian from EY and uh, there's your clicker and uh, uh, round of applause for Brian. So I'm not like stand here so I can, I can point and I can click at the same time and both quite handy. Um, so my name is Brian Sinclair, can everyone hear me? Yeah. So, can everyone hear me, yes? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so my name is Brian Sinclair, I'm in EY as a student recruitment manager looking after campus recruitment. Can everyone hear me, the volume? It is off mute. It's definitely off. I just shout for a little bit, that helped, yeah. Proper lecturer style. Um, so working student recruitment campus team, my job is to really decide with the team which universities we go to, there we go, which universities we go to and why and how, what we do there. Um, in terms of what we actually do as, a, as an organisation, give you an idea of the size and shape, we would typically do about 700 events across the, an academic year of you know, different universities. Spend what an extortionate amount of money on doing that as well. So I'm quite busy. You're really thinking, well, why are you doing that, Brian? You know, really uh, get a hobby or something, or stuff doing so many events. But really, we do it because of this. Um, so we are targeted at hiring a thousand graduates a year, and that's growing every year. Uh, we take on over 500 undergraduates as well, that's somewhere in terms of industrial placements and also people on kind of pre ID programs for first years. Um, we target currently 35 universities across the UK, but that's going to grow. As our targets grow, we're going to have to grow there a bit more. We estimate the market size of about 600,000 graduates and undergraduates. Charlie, don't tell me off on that, that's wrong, but that's what we estimate it as. We also do school year recruitment. Uh, so quite a large one there, and quite a scary figure at the bottom there, 1.2 million school leavers to target, so quite a, quite a challenge there for the school leaver guys. Um, how does the selection process? I don't think it's that extraordinary, the only thing different about EY is we're one of the few recruiters that uses a strengths-based selection process, which I'll come on to in a minute. But broadly speaking, it's we source the candidates, it's the application form, psychometric test, first written interview, assessment centre and offer. But we do pay a lot of attention to the, the top and, and the tail of that. Sourcing is quite important. We want the graduates to select us for the right reasons. We want to get to know the graduate more and have get them to know want them to know more about us before they apply. It's much easier if they deselect themselves than apply. We have quite enough applications at the moment, 25,000 applications a year, so we can make those a bit more relevant to us all the better. An offer is quite important as well, because a lot of candidates these days, especially the, the good ones, will get multiple offers and then only decide at the very last minute to get. Um, so we're left in the door to the backfill at the very last stage. We pay a lot of attention to that. So we look at you know student versus employer expectations is quite important for us. Strengths in a nutshell, so strengths versus competence. So competency based interviews about what you can do, what you've learned to do, what you're competent at doing. But strengths is about what you naturally can do, what you're innately good at, and what you actually love to do. So we would we would engage um, Lynn Lee uh, from CAPS, CAPP, Centre for Applied Positive Psychology, to design a strengths based selection process introduced back in 2009, and we're currently refreshing that at the moment to enforce some new selection tools this year. Um, but here's the key stuff. So, key issues of concern. So, we're looking at redefining employability. You know, who really needs to change here? With millennials, Gen Y, Generation and the Z now, uh, or people probably in the 10s, I think is the new phrase, because of the 10th generation of modern workforce. Who needs to change? You know, if we constantly asking the students to conform to what we think is a typical employee, and we do ourselves a disfavour as a future kind of thinking employer, um, we need to be taking on the current employees and changing ourselves so they fit better into our, our organisation and we get the best out of them. For them on campus, it's about doing subjects 
uh, is about normal subject pass the exam. So are we giving them the skills to, to do the job and not just get the job? So we're looking at doing more business focused skill sessions instead of recruitment focused. There's a lot of out there, CV, writing, mock interviews, but what skills will you need when you get in? Try to give them some of those before they join us. And then more of the same or different. So yes, we want more of Agent Smith down there, cloning himself. He's not quite smart in this reply, but he is very pale, male, stale. So we need an opportunity here. You know, will employers with increased target time more of the same, or will more numbers equal greater diversity? So an opportunity there is more diversity to go into university. The reason High Fly reports that there's more females in university than males. So why isn't that reflected in our hiring numbers? And the future leadership uh, profile as well. And then some other questions. Well, I was glad to 3D. This is very much me. This isn't an EY thing, just in case. I'm not expecting it to come elsewhere. Um, but it's the length, depth, and breadth of what's required. So, length. So, it's, students are making career decisions much earlier. Pre university, first year students are making a lot more time, a lot more first events. So, we need to establish a long term relationship with our graduates, our potential future hires. And if you do that at the start, ideally, we engage them not just to get them in the door, but through the selection process so they stay longer with us in the organisation. Depth, you want to form a deeper relationship with them. So, not just through how we select them, so we get a deeper understanding of the student to make sure they're right for us. We want after they join to learn, continue to learn about themselves, their own strengths and weaknesses should, should work. They're not, they're not being there before, they're not being in the work environment. How that they can learn more with themselves and they need to upskill themselves as they continue on in the relationship from when we first meet them to when they join to longer term in the organization. And then breadth. So, yeah, source of hiring retain more diverse candidates. There's a wider range of candidates out there we should be hiring more of those in an organisation. So, so in short, you know, we don't want, in graduate group, we don't want one night stands. We'd like the students to get to know us a lot more, form a deeper relationship, regardless of background, and choose us as their life partner. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it. That's it. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Brian. Uh, a really good start to get us going. So next up, um, uh, assuming the microphone is still working, is uh, uh, Becky McFitty from Empower. Yes, stand over here. Who's off over there? Yeah, I'm off over there. Can you all see it? Okay. I just don't want to make sure I've got the slides. Do everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Right. Lovely. Um, okay, so I'm from RWE Empower. Hopefully everyone will have heard the brand name. So we're one of the big six energy companies in the UK. Um, unlike EY, we actually have quite a small graduate recruitment programme. So we actually take about 30 graduates per year and about 20 interns. Uh, so probably a lot smaller than you, you might expect from um, a, a big brand like Empower. Um, we're also not an engineering company. We're actually very much the retail focused brand. So the engineering part of the business split off a few years ago. Um, so the Empower graduate programme really is the, is the customer services, it's the sales, the marketing, the commercial analysts, that sort of side of things. So, just to kind of clear up any confusion there when I'm talking about the grad schemes. So with, with our grad schemes, we've got four schemes. We've got quantitative risk and commercial analyst schemes, which are very quality analysts. And we actually struggle to recruit for both of those because we're looking for numerical people. And because we don't recruit in London, we do struggle to get the right skill set and the numbers of applications. Again, unlikely why we, we do actually struggle with that one. We also have quite a different scheme called, called our bespoke graduate scheme. Now this is a graduate scheme, but basically it's general business. So our graduates will come in. It tends to be graduates who don't really know what they want to do. Um, and we give them the opportunity over two years to rotate around the business in different business areas. So marketing, sales, energy services, um, PR, you know, anything like that. And it gives them that opportunity at the end to then make the decision about where they might want to go. So it's a very flexible scheme. Also a very uh, mobile scheme, so we require graduates to be very mobile. And then our last scheme is our finance scheme, so um, probably almost near similar to EY, but we're looking at kind of management accountants, business partners within finance and power. Okay, so those are just the four schemes that we recruit for. Slightly different recruitment process for each of those, but they follow the same kind of theme, which is what I'm going to talk to you about. Okay, so just quickly go through the competencies, assessment process, what we do with the assessment centre, results um, that we've seen this year from having changed the whole process for the, the campaign that's just finished. And then next steps for Empower. So we've built brand new competencies for our 2014-2015 campaigns, the one that we've just finished. Um, and that's because prior to that, the, the assessment material and things that we're using just weren't getting us the right people into assessment centres. So a couple of years ago, for example, we ran a HR assessment centre and a 
customer services assessment centre, and we didn't take anyone from that assessment centre because the quality just wasn't wasn't right. So we realised we need to do something about it. Um, and what we did was we we've changed our competencies, and they, they do match to the, the wider NPAL um, behaviours still. We've actually designed them specifically around our graduate population. So we worked with the managers within the business, what we call the scheme sponsors, who kind of look after the, the graduate schemes, and basically said to them, what are you looking for in a high-performing graduate? What do the graduates that are currently in the business that are performing well, what, what sort of things are they demonstrating, what skills do they have? Um, and, and doing that, we, we came up with these five new competencies. Um, we, we also looked at the low-performing graduates and what they were doing that, that was kind of the negative behaviours. And we've basically mapped these competencies across the whole assessment process now um, to, to basically make sure that we're getting the right people with the right fit for the business coming to those assessment centres. Um, each competency has a number of indicators beneath them, so it's not just those, those five things, which could essentially mean anything. They're broken down into lots of different elements. Um, so our assessment process, what, what we aim to do, we actually develop this mostly in-house. Um, because we're a small graduate recruitment function, we, we just don't have the budgets to be working with loads of consultancies on this sort of thing. So I think we have one consultancy day and then everything else was done ourselves. So what we aim to do is make sure each of those competencies were assessed at least three times throughout the whole process. So that by the time they came to assessment centre at the end, they would already assessed all of those competencies at some point. Um, the ones that are highlighted in well, grey, so that is, um, are the ones that are the, the primary um, assessors within each of those the areas that we do. So, fairly standard, an application form. Um, this is for our bespoke scheme, by the way. So, an application form which has competency based questions, so three questions for them to answer. We then do a verbal reasoning test. Now, for our bespoke scheme, because it's general business, we actually remove the numerical test. Um, we were using that for quite a few years, and what we found was that the numerical test was just cutting out students that shouldn't have been cut out of that process. At the end of the day, if you're going to be a HR professional or a PR professional, you don't necessarily need to be that good at maths. Um, so we got rid of that, we added the verbal reasoning, because obviously communication is very key for a lot of those roles. We have kept the numerical reasoning for the three other schemes because they, they are quite analytical and numerical focused. We then did something called graduate simulations, which was almost like an off-the-shelf SJT, but um, a computer-based one. Um, we, had, we actually found they didn't work very well for us. Basically, all of the graduates were passing them with something like a 95% success rate. Um, so we were actually going to scrap them for next year as we were essentially spending money on something that we didn't need as a filter tool. Uh, we then did the telephone interviews um, and then the assessment centre mm -hmm. at the end. What we did do was develop new telephone interview questions and application form questions, which obviously built around our new competencies. Um, so it's probably quite hard to read, but obviously you can send the slides around after for anyone who's interested. Um, this basically just shows how we developed our telephone interview questions um, in terms of, so just for example, the first question, can you give me an example of when you've had to adapt quickly to a changing situation? Um, it's obviously links to innovation and openness to change. Um, pulling out some, some of those key indicators. So we basically made sure that all of those indicators were covered off that somewhere throughout that process to ensure the best people were coming through to assessment centre. So at assessment centre, we again revamped the material. We did work with a um, third party to help us do that for one of the exercises, and then we did some of it ourselves as well, but again, a bit cost saving. Um, we start our, the interview is the first thing that the candidate has to do, um, and we start the interview with a strengths-based presentation. Now, our main reason for doing this is actually more to settle the candidate down than anything else. So we ask them to pre-prepare a presentation where they talk about their strengths and what, and what they are, and give examples of how they how they can share their strengths. Um, what we find it just eases in it nicely to a competency-based interview because most people are fairly confident to talk about themselves and what they've done and what they're good at and it then leads nicely into the conversation for the assessors to understand the examples that they're using in that interview a little bit more. Um, so we find that a, nice, a nicety really to start but actually you can see at the bottom it doesn't actually uh, have a huge weighty on the, on the results. Um, we've also done new interview questions to match competencies. We've done a new group exercise to make it more of a day in the life of a graduate. So we actually spoke to our graduates, asked them what they actually do, and what sort of projects they actually get involved in. And we designed a situation which was much more relevant and much more like a, a real business meeting would be. Um, and then we've designed a new in-tray uh, presentation. So the in-tray presentation, which I'm going to go through um, in a second, is basically a, it's a brand new thing for us. We haven't done it before, but it gives them a load of emails. If I just flip over gives them a, a load of emails which they have to do, they have to pretend they're in a customer service environment, um, it's a very relevant to our business, 
Uh, their manager's gone off sick or on leave or something, and they've basically got to pick up a load of work. It's a very relevant and very um, day in the life of type thing, so a lot of our graduates will end up in this sort of situation. They've got to read a load of emails of all sorts of different things, there's a few tri trick ones in there, like bingo games and fire drills and stuff like that, and they have to write them on how high priority they think those are and how they would respond to the emails. Now, the, the, what they have to do is actually go and present that back to an assessor who pretends to be their manager and questions them on it. So it's a little bit like a, a business meeting with your manager. Um, and it's, it's really interesting, a lot of the assessors were really um, quite pleased with this exercise because it was just so real life. And just what we, what we found was a lot of candidates will come in and absolutely nail the interview. They'll do really well in an interview because they're so well prepared for a competency-based interview. What they can't do is prepare for something like this or the group exercise because they just don't know what's going to be thrown at them. So it really helped to see the candidates that can really think on their feet and are really switched on. Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was a really good exercise for us. Um, just switching back to this one. So we also introduced an extra analytical task for our commercial analysts um, just to make sure we've got that analytical ability covered. Um, we, we mark each exercise against the, against the indicator, so all the, the marking criteria against those new indicators and they get an average score, which you can see from the bottom how we work it out for each of the competencies. So the results uh, from this year, so obviously I don't know how well these graduates will actually do when they start in the business because they don't start till September, so fingers crossed this time next year they'll all be high flyers. Um, but what we do know is that we had a high conversion rate from AC assessment centre to hire, um, so that 39% of people who came to our assessment centre were hired, and actually even more of those candidates were good enough to be hired, but we have a quota on how many we can take. So for our bespoke scheme, we offered 20, and we actually had eight people who were good enough for reserves, um, so much, much better from last year, which was 25%. And this is an interesting one, higher average score from the selected candidates. So when we look at our bespoke candidates from last year compared to this year, although we're measuring against different competencies and different assessments, when you actually look at the average score, um, it had gone up quite a lot, so 3.97 compared to the 3.68, which showed us the quality and, and what we were hearing from the managers is that the quality they were seeing was much higher um, than, than ever before. So it shows that we're getting the right fit and the right people coming through. Low number of dropouts, which hopefully means that candidates coming through, and, you know, likes the business, wanted to work for us with the right type of people and therefore chose not to go elsewhere. Um, so last year we had nine dropouts, which was quite horrific, <laughs> meant we had to reopen quite a lot of scheme, schemes and spend a lot of money. Um, so this year we've only had three dropouts um, since offering, which is great for us. Next steps for us, um, we want to reduce the length, length of our application form next year. And um, what we've realised is we're asking loads of really pointless questions, so A-level results, making them list every single A-level they've got, making them list every single module that they've done in their first year and second year of the degree. But actually a lot of the time we don't really care as long as it's uh, you know, they're going to get a, a 2-1, for example. We don't want to list all the modules. And what I think we're losing out to people who, students who tend to be a bit lazy, and they, they think, oh, I can't be bothered to fill all this form in. I don't know how long it's going to take me. So we want to make that just easier for candidates. Moving the talent sims, um, but we're looking at the possible introduction of an OPQ. Cost dependent, of course, but um, looking at how we could use an OPQ to match to our competencies, and that might give us a slightly uh, different variation of, um, you know, looking for the candidates with the right traits and behaviours. So if anyone's ever done anything like that, I'd be really interested to hear from you because it's something we've not tried before. Uh, so we're relying on the likes of SHL to sell it to us, so I'd love to hear some examples if it's worked for you. Uh, we want to introduce video interviewing, and I think a lot of people are going down this route. Again, not sure how well it will work for us because we've not done it before, um, but from a Certainly a cost saving and time efficiency, it makes sense. And what we're hearing a lot of ad hoc feedback is that the candidates love it as well. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll see some success of that. Um, and just some general small tweaks to our process in terms of better assessor training, making sure we've got a better length of time between closing dates and assessment centres so there's better candidate experience. Um, we're trying to make a lot of those changes this year um, just generally to make the, the experience better for, for everyone involved. Um, that is it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. I guess the, the benefit of going last is that I can just say that it's been covered by the other two. Um, but I took a slightly different approach um, when thinking about kind of picking winners. Um, and the more as I was going through doing the presentation and putting the slides together, I realised that I actually had more questions for you guys um, than, than I had um, to answer myself. So um, a, lot of, a lot of kind of the presentation and what I'm going to go through is kind of thoughts 
um, about how BDO are thinking and how we're approaching recruitment and some of the things that, that we're kind of considering and the challenges that we're facing around that. Um, so, I mean, just to put it into context, this is um, an idea uh, of BDO as an organisation. Um, we operate very much in the same field as EY, um, but on a much, much smaller scale. So we are the fifth largest accountancy network globally, uh, but from the numbers even just recruiting in the UK, we recruit around 450 graduates, school leavers, interns, and summer school candidates. So we're a lot, we're a lot smaller than the big four accounting firms. Um, but we have got a nice range, I think, of, of graduate recruiters and the numbers that we hire here. Um, in terms of kind of the, the challenges and considerations that I guess I wanted to put forward today, I um, was very much thinking about picking winners as a threefold in terms of recruitment. So the attraction, the selection, and the retention side of things. What we're starting to find is as our business grows, um, we are getting more and more specialist, more and more niche types of roles. Um, and what the business are looking for from graduates is that they actually understand what they're applying for, they understand what those roles are. Um, so how do we attract people into those more specialist functions and how do we get the students to actually know what they are and turn up on the day understanding what they've applied to. Um, one of the, the questions that came up to me, I've been in student recruitment and development of some kind for the last coming up to 11 years. Um, and whilst it feels like nothing's really changed, actually quite a lot changes over time. It very much used to be the company presentations were the way forward. Then there was a whole debate of our people just turning up for the free food and wine. So everyone stopped doing that. And now it's kind of come to the fore. It's like our careers first, the way forward. And I know um, a number of organizations within, certainly within the accounting industry have chosen to opt out of that. Whether that was a right move or not, we don't know. So that was, that was kind of one of my first questions was our careers fair the future. And another of the challenges on our plates at the moment is diversity. So talking about things that have already been spoken about this morning, but social, social mobility, um, accounting still remains a very much a male dominated industry. How do we attract females into that? So these are all challenges that are being put to us um, and things we need to think about when picking winners. Um, the, again, building again on the topic from this morning, uh, there's very much a perception, and I think that because there's more graduate vacancies, there's a perception that we feel graduates think it's easier to get into the regional offices. I'll get in there, I'll get my foot in the door, I'll do my training, then I'll go down to London. Um, I get so much pushback from the business saying, why aren't they staying? We spend all this time investing in them, training them, and then London get them when they start to actually be a return on investment. So. That is yet another challenge that we're facing. Um, and the other one is penultimate year internships. We, we offer a summer internship for students in the summer before graduation. Is that too late? Um, we know that students are thinking about their careers a lot earlier on. They're thinking about that when they go to university. They're much more switched on, certainly, uh, than I was when I was at university. So are we, are we missing a trip by, by only picking them up in their second year? Um, then moving on to, to selection, we have seen um, a lot of movement throughout the year. So we'll start the year with a kind of idea of the targets that we want nationally. That is moving, that is growing every year. So we're kind of trying to play catch up all the time in terms of attraction, in terms of selection. Those numbers keep changing and on the positive, they keep going up. But it means that we are recruiting much later into the academic year. Um, so that then poses the question that is the milk brand window what it used to be? Is the September to December where everyone's on campus and everyone's running assessment days all at that time, is that how graduate recruitment is going? Um, or is it very much, we found a lot of students are tending to focus on getting the 2-1 or a first and then applying once they've graduated. So again, are we missing a trick by filling our roles in that milk brand window and not waiting for students um, that, that have graduated and are interested in looking in that summer. Um, an internal challenge for us is, is our selection process. So because we need to attract more students, because we need to get more through the door because of changing numbers, we need to make our processes really, really efficient um, and make sure that our interviewers are rigorous, that we're holding we're holding more efficient processes so that we're not running them and, and not getting candidates through. Um, and social mobility, again, um, you know, we're, we're very much being driven to look beyond university, beyond A-level qualifications, 
um, and actually start to think more about the personality-driven recruitment, the, the profiles of those right for the role, rather than what their academic background shows about them. However, research shows when talking to graduates that they don't like that. They don't like psychometric tests. They don't like personality-driven recruitment. So another challenge, how do we, how do we find that balance and, and not put students off? Um, and then the final key area that looks at is, is retention. Um, so uh, certainly within BDO, the business love the school leavers. They stay for longer than the graduates, they are committed, they are hungry, uh, they come in, they're on a five year programme rather than the three year programme that we run for the graduates. So school leaver numbers are going up and up and up. Graduate numbers are rising, but not at the same rate as school leavers. So is, is there gonna be a trend where soon school leaver roles overtake the number of graduates that, that employers are hiring? Um, salary expectations, again, we've seen an increase in the last couple of years coming out of the recession. Salaries are going up. We need to make sure internally as a business that we are, we are on top of that and we can offer an attractive package. Um, and finally, something that uh, Brian mentioned was building on what a new generation wants. Are we geared up? Um, accountancy is traditionally seen as quite a stuffy, formal, um, old, old-fashioned organisation. We have partners of a completely different generation. Are we able to adapt and offer graduates what they want and what they need in the market? Um, just quickly talking about our selection process. I won't dwell on this. It's, it's not that dissimilar from the other guys. We have online applications. We do psychometric tests. We do the numerical and logical reasoning. Uh, we actually have a face-to-face -face interview. We have kept that in deliberately, even though it's quite time consuming and it takes up a lot of business time, but we find that it's actually a bit of a USP for us that they come into the business and they're actually meeting with a manager that they'll potentially be working with. Um, and then we have a final um, a full day assessment day using group exercise, written exercise, presentation, partner interview. Um, in terms of, I guess, the, the graduate marketplace and just to highlight some of the challenges, um, I don't, you probably can't read it very well, but from the High Flyers report, accountancy is down 7.4% in terms of the number of applications they get. But actually, accounting firms are recruiting a lot more graduates. So, as a student recruiter within that industry, that fills me with dread because less and less people are applying to accountancy, yet we want more and more candidates. So, there's, there's a, bit of a, a bit of a deficit going on there. Um, we've also seen starting salaries rise again um, and graduate recruitment at its highest level for seven years. So competition and that, that whole concept of war for talent um, is starting to gear up again um, and going great guns. Um, and finally, the, the last point that I wanted to just touch on was, was the idea of the millennials and being geared up. We know um, from recent reports that, that most graduates at the moment will probably say they'll spend on average 2.9 years with their first employers. Our graduate programmes are for three years, so we, we can almost assume that we've invested in them, we train them, and then they're gone. So how are we going to adapt to making sure that we don't pay all that money to train them to get them professionally qualified for somebody else to reap the benefits? Um, we need to be focusing more on work-life balance, flexibility, the things that are important to, to students coming out of university and not just assuming that pay and development um, are, are their core areas of focus. Um, and that's kind of it from me. I think the, the majority of it should be over to you guys, but I just wanted to raise some, some points and challenges so you can kind of see what's happening in, in our world. But thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, just to make sure we've got plenty of questions up, let's ask one of the great core team to see if we can push all back to one and then um, uh, we'll um, have time for questions. Thanks. Um, so, um, loads of stuff to go out there. I mean, the big thing that comes across to me, and it's certainly something we, we, it's very close to, to our heart grad core with uh, the grad schemes that we operate, is that, that there's a lot of thought and uh, real consideration goes into these processes. And I think sometimes that's not fully appreciated, uh, how, how much consideration has to go into doing this properly, uh, and the, the levels of process and, and, and uh, uh, research that go behind uh, some of this work. So, uh, let's see if we've got some questions. Hopefully we have. Um, and um, uh, stick a hand up and say who you are when the mic comes around. So uh, I've got Femi down here. Yeah, so Thanks very much. That was a really interesting session. Um, what I wanted to do is um, kind of answer one of your questions in a way. 
around the models or just raise a point around the models that you're using, which are in a way quite traditional as graduate recruiters. So for example, the internship, the summer internship, when we look at the, some of the discussions that we've had around social mobility this morning, so many of the grad, uh, that my undergraduates are working part-time. Now, they get these part-time roles and they want to hang on to them in a way across to three years because that's how they're financing themselves. So for them, a summer, re, a, a summer internship, no matter how fantastic it looks, means that they have to give up the, their stake in their part-time role, which means that model uh, to attract people from particular backgrounds, lower socioeconomic groups, Bones group doesn't necessarily work for them. So I do think as graduate recruiters starting to look at how those traditional models could change to suit the way people are having to finance themselves through university would be quite useful. And I think most of us as institutions would love to work with graduate recruiters around coming up with some new models that would suit the type of undergraduates that we have now. Guys, any comments on that? I personally think that's a, it's a fantastic point. Um, what I guess my my challenge to that is: what do we what do we do? How do we get around that? How do we still give them the same opportunities? Uh, what what can we offer? You know, if it's not if it's not about insights in the summer or in the spring or in, in any of the holidays, they need to hang on to those jobs. What are the other alternatives? Um, that I think might be it's really challenging us to look at curriculum. So those kind of opportunities can happen within the curriculum because that's where the students kind of invest in their time and their money. And therefore, I think all of us have got to think more out of the box in terms of how do we present these opportunities. And I do think that we have to start looking at, even initially, if it's just two weeks or, 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 or something like that, well, how does that happen within the curriculum so that more students from particular backgrounds have access to those experiences? Because you, you will still get those people from the higher socioeconomic groups being able to take up some more opportunities because they can finance it. Yeah. I was going to say, um, if I may, um, it's kind of a self fulfilling prophecy in some cases. The ADO announced that 60% of students who have water or organisation get those jobs. But even looking simply around numbers, we are far less summer interns and industrial placements to meet our grad numbers, and we still need raw graduates who haven't worked. As long as you, as a graduate, can come to an employer and make your skills relevant to the employer, be it stacking shelves in the supermarket, working in the bar, if you can make that relevant, then the employer will, you know, we still have roles for you. Um, and not all of our summer interns or industrial placements get a job. You know, it's a try before you buy, and that works two ways. We try the students and say goodbye to them. Um, so it's not set in stone that you must walk from the floor on a summer intern or under displacement. And yes, a lot of employers are offering one, two day, week long kind of training programs. You can come in, particularly for first years, but also for second years as well. We do inside days as well to give an idea of what it's like to work. And if an employer is switched on enough, we're not quite there with the employee in fairness. But if an employer has switched on, if you get an employee, your potential employee, a student or graduate into an organisation for a day or a couple of days, you should have enough from that to swap. You know, there's a bit of a spark, <coughs> which is good, and stay in touch when they go back to campus for the final year and make the mailing list, etc. Um, so no, I don't think. I think it is a little bit of self fulfilling prophecy. You must walk here to get a job here. You must do an internship. You know, there's plenty of other roles available for people who haven't already worked for organisation. And final point I'd say is. We've acquired a candidate, not the CV. So some candidates have worked in competitive organisations and they come apply to EY, and on paper it looks like, oh, they've got similar stuff. But really, they want to learn some bad habits from the culture of their organisation that we don't want in EY. So we still bring them in for an interview and assess them. And even though they look on paper to be a perfect match or a near perfect match, we go, eh, not for us, thanks very much. And not that you're a bad candidate, you're just not right for us. Yeah, if you want to hear yeah. uh, yeah. yeah. um, so, <laughs> something that we do at NPAM is a, um, we run undergraduate competitions. <coughs> now, so we're just revamping ours at the moment, but previously what we've done is um, a competition for future leaders uh, where the students are encouraged to come up with a sustainability initiative. Um, we invite them to a team building weekend and then we send them away back to university for four months where they have to implement their idea and their initiative. 
then they do a video, send it back, and then uh, we do a big final and kind of winning winning team, which last year was an awesome prize. They win a trip to the Amazon rainforest to go and live and work for a tribe, as well as a summer internship. Um, the great thing of that, in terms of the social mobility aspect, is it's something that students are doing in their own time while they're at university to gain employability skills. And even if they're not successful in, in winning the prize, we, they've kind of already made their name available to us, so it's something they can do alongside a part-time job. They just have to push themselves to use their spare time more wisely um, in working on their on their project and their team. Um, and a lot of those students, even the ones that, which didn't win internships or were already the prize, will then come back to us and join us in the grad scheme. And what we really struggle with is actually getting the universities to promote the competition for us. We, we struggle to get the, the kind of the word out there without paying an absolute fortune to various advertising companies. That's, that's something I'd really like to support with uh, from the universities. Fantastic, great start. Uh, next question. Thank you. Um, really Sorry. enthused <laughs> by the conversation around skills-based recruitment, because actually I do think right use of that's quite important. But the one thing that, that I find comes out time and time again is references to culture and not being the right fit. How do we as organisations train or open that up to people when it's such abstract? And, you know, I suppose, are there any trends about the reasons why you don't take our great graduates on they get through all the assessment centres, they get through all the tick box exercises? It would be useful for us to know what, what are those things that aren't quite making great so we can know what to do about it. So it's question well, so that makes a culture and also then get an I'd say, first of all, what is culture? What is British culture? What is English culture versus Scottish culture, Irish culture? Um, that itself is hard to define. In an organisation, you could have wrap up a number of skills and competencies and common traits that employees demonstrate and call that your corporate culture. It's how you, you know, speak to a subordinate in your organisation, how a leader talks to people in the team, how you address a client with an email or, you know, what you're going to keep focused in an organisation. Is it money? Is it just getting the job done? Is it building a relationship with your staff and teams? And it's a lot of those competence behaviours or employee strengths that really define an organisation's culture. So we're not necessarily going to teach you how to be an EY person. I don't know what is an EY person. By definition, if we're a more diverse organisation, there shouldn't be an EY person. What we can do is talk to students about what our sort of people are like, come and meet our people at various events, either in the office or out on campus. And if you like those people, you know, quite simply, we're human beings, it is a bit of a connection to the students point anyways. That has to be at some, some level. If you like EY people, then apply to us. Continue on the selection process. If you don't like us, that's fine. <laughs> Deselect yourself from the selection process. Do not waste your time applying to us. It is a lot of time for students to go through application forms, you know, tests, interviews, etc. Make that decision up front. Besides, I've met a few EY folk. Yeah, you're all right. Uh, but if you like it, then yeah, hopefully you get to work with that person on board. So I completely agree with that, and I think there's um, certainly the large graduate recruiters have a lot of events on campus in their offices. There's so many opportunities for them to meet with people and to find out about the culture. Um, on most company websites nowadays, they have their they have their core values, which very much demonstrate what's important to that organisation, and they show more of the. You know, if, if something resonates with a with a student and they say, you know what, they're my values, they're things that are important to me. Um, what we find where where students fall down is they don't take advantage of those opportunities as often as they should. They don't bother to look at the. They're so focused on getting a job and getting through the process that they forget that you know. And certainly in, in the world that EY and BDO operate in, it's a professional services firm. You have to be able to get on with people. You have to work in teams. It's so crucial to let your personality come across and be somewhere where you want to be. Um, and that often gets sidelined in terms of, I'll get the tick box, I'll, I'll say the right things, and um, they forget to, to be themselves and be a person. I, I mean, we've got Glassdoor on this afternoon doing a session and again, loads of insights I guess on there for the kind of culture thing that aren't maybe on the official website, <laughs> um, that, that can, can be useful for students and grads trying to get an insight uh, into what an organisation is really like. Okie doke, uh, yep. Question back here, David. I'm speaking as an ex person. I, um, I, I'm just 
curiously, uh, we see so many applications, um, and this next factor isn't a that doesn't come into your process necessarily. How do you identify the next factor? And when you're dealing with that number of applications, how, how do you root out the ones that have the next factor that you want to take on and build a fit with the culture and mean that being really is likely to progress? <coughs> I don't think Simon Kelly even knows what the next factor is. Um, and if someone can come up with an algorithm that tell us what is going to make a partner in 15 years and pay that person significant amount of money, all we can do really is just look at what we think works, what EY does as an organisation, the type of traits that are demonstrated in successful people who work in EY, and then translate that into you looking for it during the selection process when we meet and talk with the candidates. Um, we did introduce the strengths-based selection process back in 2009, we did it for 18 months, um, so they're into 2009 and they're refreshing at the moment. Um, that is about you know, asking the candidate, what do you like? I mean, what, what are you good at? What do you enjoy doing? And if that matches with what you will be doing in EY, then you will love working here. And if that doesn't match, you're not going to enjoy working here, so we will quite politely reject you from the selection process because it's just not going to work out. The relationship's just not going to last. Um, yeah. um, I think going to the, from the application perspective, we obviously get more applications than we have roles. Um, and I think with, with some of that, it has to be, we don't have a fixed number of applications that we will put through. So if we see, I mean, we, we get sort of tens of thousands of applications for our roles, but if we see 9,000 fantastic applications, we will put them <coughs> through the process and filter them out through the process, so we don't just take the 10% of the applications. So quite often we get an awful lot of applications where candidates clearly haven't put in the time or the effort. Uh, they might have one grade that, that doesn't meet our, our minimum benchmark and, and so they just haven't bothered with the rest of it. Whereas actually, if you put in that time and effort, you will get through. There isn't a quota, um, certainly a BDO for the number of applications. So we're not really looking for an X factor at that stage. We're looking for, for a solid, good application. I think just from us, it's really important to have. Um, well, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I think it's really important to have the right assessors at assessment centre. Um, so we have, we actually outsource the majority of our process into an assessment centre. Um, but at assessment centre, we're really key on making sure the scheme sponsors and the managers who work for graduates are part of that assessment panel. Because um, at the end of the day, they're the ones who have worked with, with graduates who've gone on to be high performers. So they're the ones who can kind of spot. The, the people who are going to kind of follow those footsteps, I think more so than, than me and my colleague in graduate recruitment can. And so it's just something we do to make sure that we're, we are getting the right people in. How do you guys avoid the, the danger that, I, I'm not sure it's as prevalent maybe as it used to be, but as we were kind of hearing from Connor earlier on about the kind of, um, there's a tendency in some organisations, particularly I think in sort of legal, uh, is, is a big culprit for this, of looking at the schools and the universities to say the partners went to, and, and, and either the partners might push that or say, you know, uh, you know, are, are we look, are we looking at uh, you know Repton this year or whatever? Um, so um, uh, how how do you guys handle that? Does that come up still? Or and if it does, how do you how do you deal with that? Um, so interesting when I moved over to the campus team in January. Um, I asked them a question, so why did we go to these two and five universities and why do we spend a amount here and not so much over there? Um, and I got a very, hmm, not quite sure answer. It's like, okay, we need to have a look at this properly. So what we've started to develop in the Y is our own university league table. So we looked at historical data, such as application numbers, offers, offers acceptances, then looking at um, the things like, what is the university look like, the university has been like ratio, so for ability to uh, stay, Okay, this is what we're talking about from the list of data. Um, and looking at things like, um, oh, as we have in the, the matrix, it's quite complex. We have things like, what's the, how does EY rank in the university? How does the university itself rank in the Guardian and the Times, etc.? Put it all together and work out kind of a sliding scale score of each university as a snapshot of where we are right now. Obviously, different data comes out at different times of years. We won't really have our full end of year application, which will be closed in a month or two. Uh, the next set of your high school data is just out, and the university is just out as well. So it just gets updated every, every so often the data comes in. We're going to look at that for the next uh, six to 12 months. We're going to add it to some of the universities who we're interested in exploring and working with as well, start to track that, so we can then put up a more data-driven approach 
to which universities we go to and why, and then being the county or the firm, there's going to be a correlation to spend on campus, the number of offers, and eventually working with the exam training and the NLD guys to actually retention of the organisation. So it's not something we can do straight away that would be really fair to do that, but we need to have some sort of methodology in place now which we're building to really start looking at going forward why we come to universities, we need the G who gets the priority, who gets the lower down the ranks, and which of the universities should be really recently sent to the work as well. I think for us it's quite difficult to do a data driven approach where it's obviously a really great idea, but we only take 30 graduates a year. So what we find actually is every year with where those other than Warwick and Birmingham um, because of our location, it's just completely random. So we really struggle to do any particular targeting, especially for um, our bespoke scheme because it's just so broad, so varied, and they could be anywhere in the country. Um, so we're we're fairly open to working with, with kind of any universities. Obviously, budget restrictions are always an issue for us, and um, so we tend to kind of focus on the, the more local universities. But but then a big thing for us is also using our current graduates to go back to their universities because everyone likes to hear it from an alumni person more than they would from a graduate recruiter. And so we we use you know wherever they come from, it doesn't matter where they are, we'll send them back there to try and get people from their course and they need to, to apply to us as well. And that tends to be the approach we take there. Excellent. Um, of course, when we talk about technology, um, and technology is obviously a big part of the selection process, we, we, we've been using video interviews for years, it came up on a couple of presentations. So, um, I mean, video interviews is just one, one aspect. I mean, what, uh, we found that a very beneficial part of the recruitment process when we've used mm -hmm. it. But what are the technology, are you, what do you think about video interviews, I guess, and, and then also more broadly, what, what are you looking at in terms of what elements of technology come into your process at different points? I think it's quite hard in a very competitive market to have any kind of USP in a selection process. Um, and the one thing that we found as uh, a competitor to the big four who have a much bigger brand name than us is that our USP is that we can bring people into the organisation and they can see the offices, they can meet people, they can, they can get a feel for the culture. And I think when you move more into the technology of a phone interview with possibly with a with an outsourced company, if you use video technology, if you have these virtual assessment days that seem to be getting great guns at the moment, you lose a lot of that personal interaction. You you don't give students the opportunity to get to know an organisation. So we are very much at this point in time taking the sense that we are going to to keep it a personal process and give students the, the opportunity to, to engage with us and look into the whites of our eyes. I was going to say, um, we're going to do a bit of analysis around um, the time spent in for a certain interview to say that we're going to as well. Probably. But there's a lot of pushback from this as we're going to a growth support, a big ambitious to grow as a firm. And how much is that taken away from client engagement work and the kind of costs associated with that or the lost revenue associated with that? So compared that to if we did do um, you know, telephone interviews or, or, or video interviews, um, what would we do with that extra time? Not all of the goal of the client work, but saying, well, can we kind of replace that or offset the interaction? Just forgetting the guys out on campus more. So instead of bringing the student into an office and doing an interview, can we do them on campus or can we do a telephone interview or can we do a video interview? Option we, we consider not the side of just yet. But if we do go down that way, we are so not going to let the buzz off book. If you spend even four or five hours over the course of a year doing interviewing, then that to us equals four or five hours of more student recruitment. You could use that by going out on campus and speaking to your students. It's not a glass of wine while doing it. But <laughs> it is about getting out there and that hopefully will offset the lack of interaction during the selection process, but not the sort of thing. One of the things we do, so video and video, I can't comment on too much because we've not started doing it yet. We've still on telephone interviews, but in terms of the, the process or the part of the, the process of the candidates is we heavily promote our Facebook page, we do a lot of Facebook Q&As, and um, so we get our current grads to go on and um, do quite a status from kind of the end of our graduates page, we get the grads to comment back and we just advertise that out to everyone who's applied for the scheme, and it's just quite a nice bit of, I guess you could call it technology, not on Facebook, it's, it's good because it is, it's not face to face, but it's real life and it's genuine. Like, we genuinely get the graduates to sit there on Facebook between four o'clock and eight o'clock and reply to the comments coming through to the candidates. And we don't give them any briefing on it, we basically just say, be honest, 
you know, be nice. Um, <laughs> so we find that's quite nice for the candidate experience. It doesn't cost anything and it's really easy to do and the graduates love doing it. Um, so it's just a little bit easy. Right, I'm going to draw us to a close there because we are on one o'clock and I've already delayed your lunch by 15 minutes. I uh, hope you don't mind. The, the biscuits hopefully tidied you over. Um, so we're going to break now for 45 minutes so we'll be back on track at the end of lunch but hopefully that's still plenty of time for networking and uh, goodbye to all. Make sure you go and check out this incredible illustration that is kind of taking shape over here. There's all manner of great stuff on there. Um, uh, speakers as well, check your portraits out. And, uh, uh, yeah, really good. Um, so, um, yeah, we'll see you back in here at quarter to two. Uh, enjoy your lunch and if you could uh, show your appreciation of the panel, then you've been great. Thank you.